Welcome to our fourth episode of the Bee History series. Now it's time to talk about Mary the First. So your biography about Mary the First has had really good reviews. How different it is from the other books about Mary? Well, I mean, what was very striking to me when I was doing my research on Mary and talking to people was the fact that very often people got confused between Mary, Mary Tudor and Mary Queen of Scots, who of course are completely different people, or they didn't really know anything about Mary other than that she was sort of dis has been described as Bloody Mary, that of course she burned, you know, countless numbers, almost 300 Protestants. And when I said to people, but did you know she was the first crowned Queen of England? She was the first woman to wear the crown of England. Very few people knew that. And of course, you know, that she had been uh, Elizabeth's predecessor, that she set many precedents for Elizabeth. You know, Elizabeth could learn from Mary's mistakes and Mary, of course, did make mistakes. However, she, she really was a political pioneer and she changed the English monarchy for good. Um, and so for me, you know, telling that story of her, um, as a, as, a political, as a political figure, not just a kind of Catholic tyrant as Protestant uh, propaganda subsequently has portrayed her, was very important indeed. And I felt like there was a way in which Mary could be, I mean, I wasn't seeking to necessarily rehabilitate her and say, wasn't she fantastic? But I think move beyond this very much maligned image of Mary and try and get a bit of perspective and sort of peel back the layers of Protestant spin in a way that has been, uh, that has in many ways sort of controlled her, her reputation since. Could you share any unknown facts about her? Well, I think one of the things that Mary did, and I mean, it's, in a way, it's the, the name of the act, which I was, you know, is one of the most significant things I think she did, is a, is a very long title, but the short uh, title for it is the Act for Regal Power. And it's an act which is on the statute book from 1554. And basically, as I say, it's got a very long title, but in short, it established the gender equality, if you like, in law of the monarch. It said that a female monarch had as much power, as power fully and absolutely as their male predecessors. You know, no more, but also no less. And that was absolutely crucial. And, in, and that was really in a response to a proposal by some of Mary's supporters that because she was a woman for the first time and because law up until that point had been gendered, in other words, it had referred to male monarchs, that actually Mary didn't have to be bound by law, that she could rule above the law and therefore kind of do what she liked. And Mary sort of decides that no, she doesn't, that's not the right thing. She wants to be a parliamentary monarch. She wants to rule by law. However, this act absolutely ensures, and of course is still there on the statute book, that a female monarch would have as much power as their male predecessors. So I think, you know, she, in many ways, she really sort of blazed a trail there. And I think that's sort of, you know, it's those kind of details of her as this political pioneer that many people aren't aware of. She died young. What do you think it would have happened if she had produced an heir? Well, if Mary had produced an heir, I mean, and of course Mary tried to produce an heir. I mean, Mary did what was expected. She married. She married Philip of Spain, which was a pretty, you know, politically uh, shrewd, actually, marriage. I mean, he was a very important figure in Europe, and an Anglo-Spanish alliance was a very, you know, strong and important one. It was, of course, there was a great deal of anxiety about, you know, what would mean if Mary married? You know, what would it mean? Because she was a woman and therefore should be subservient to her husband and would therefore Mary as queen lose control. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a very sort of fantastically uh, favourable prenup, basically a marriage treaty was worked out that really kind of controlled uh, Philip's position and, you know, was very much about ensuring that Mary remained sort of politically, the, the, you know, the queen. However, yes, she tries to have a, a child, and in many ways this really proves to be the undoing of her. I mean, she has tragic phantom pregnancies, which I talk about in the book, where she thinks she's pregnant, even an announcement is made that she's had the child, and then it's discovered that actually she hasn't, and then, you know, the dates have to be recalculated, and still England holds its breath waiting for an heir, and still it doesn't come. And obviously this, you know, is fundamentally undermining of Mary as a woman and also as a queen. If she'd had an heir, then the Catholic restoration, which she'd began during her reign, 
would no doubt have um, carried on. Elizabeth would have been displaced from the line of succession and so Elizabeth wouldn't have inherited the throne. So, I mean, it's one of those great kind of counterfactuals of history, you know, what if? Yeah. Um, and, you know, similarly, if Mary had lived a bit longer, I mean, she had only reigned for five years. She was looking to overturn the Protestant church and re-establish Catholicism. And that was going to take a long time to kind of re-engage people's hearts and minds. So it could have been a very different story if Mary had uh, lived for longer and if she'd had an heir.